Dune Part 2 is one of those movies where you can pause at almost any time and have a wallpaper worthy frame that you'll want to print and hang it on the wall. But before the new Dune movies, it has spawned numerous attempts to adapt its complex narrative, despite the source material being initially considered unfilmable. At that time, one kid was writing and drawing stories from the book, dreaming of making Dune into a movie one day. When he saw the 1984 Dune movie directed by David Lynch, he felt excited but also slightly unsatisfied, thinking that someday someone else would do it again. Almost 40 years later, that kid now known as Denny Villeneuve became a filmmaker himself and created Dune, Part 1 and Part 2. Denny has always been focused on the visuals, which can be seen in all of his films. In fact, one day he plans to make a movie with no dialogue in it, solely focusing on visuals. In this video, we'll talk about the key element of visual storytelling in his new Dune movies. Color has always been an integral part of Denny's visual language, and Dune uses color in a very unique way, different from most other films, especially the brightness of colors. Oh, you think darkness is your ally? You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it. This is the average color of every frame from all the Batman films throughout the years. Looking at it, we can see how the movies progressively got darker. Same thing with Harry Potter, Spider-Man, and almost any other movie franchise. And then you have Dune. This is the color script for the original Dune movie, and this is for the new one. While the other films got darker, Dune got brighter. This was done on purpose. As the cinematographer and the lead colorist of the film said, they wanted the interiors of Dune to have very low light levels because they really wanted to cause the audience to experience the harshness and the burn of Iraqis when you go outside on that planet. Exposure was quite down in the interiors, so your eye iris is out. When you go outside, you then get blasted by the sun and you iris down. Another notable takeaway from Dune is its muted color palette which reflects the harshness of its environment. The climate of Iraqis is brutal and quickly obliterates the conception of romanticism in the desert. The color and texture suggest that this is a dangerous place where you likely won't survive. When Paul Atreides lands on Arakin, he's confronted to a new planet, a planet, the most converted and most dangerous planet in the galaxy. Extreme temperatures and treacherous weather events make life outside the cities of Arrakis truly hostile, with sandstorms powerful enough to cut through metal. From a color perspective, Denis wanted Arrakis to be harsh and desolate. It's everything that's on Arrakis is all like stone, brown, sand color. When trying to think of the color palette right for the desert scenes, they couldn't find a film set in the desert that they liked, and that was appropriate for this movie. Cinematographer Greg Fraser ended up finding some stills online with references for the color. The sky was more white than blue, and the sand was lighter, but not a sandy yellow, more a light brown with blended tone. Arrakis is one of the driest inhabited planets in the universe, so the white skies and light sand suggest a lack of water, particularly in the atmosphere, since they didn't want to imply there is much moisture in the air. This video is sponsored by CapCut and they challenged us to recreate the look from Dune using their video editing software. Let's start by importing the video that will color grade and the reference shot from the movie. We'll start by turning on the color oscilloscope. This gives us three color scopes, RGB parade, RGB waveform, and vector scope. The waveform RGB scope shows all the three colors that make up a video image. The left part of the scope shows pixels in the left part of the image and levels on the right show pixels in the right part of the image. Right parts show up in the upper area of the waveform and shadows on the bottom. Sometimes it's confusing to see all the three colors in one scope. That's why we have the RGB parade, which shows the waveform for the three colors side by side instead of on top of each other. Vectoroscope measures the hue and saturation of the colors. The distance from the center tells us how saturated the colors are. A small dot in the center means it's a black and white shot. A trace close to the surrounding circle means the colors are very saturated. When we compare the vector scope of our shot with the one for the scene from the movie, we can see how much more saturated our shot is. 
so we'll start by decreasing the saturation to match the levels on the vector scope of the movie shot. This already did much of a job in recreating the look, but as we can see from the RGB parade scopes, and just by looking at the two shots, the colors still need some adjusting. For that, we'll use RGB curves. This tool enables us to control each color channel separately, and like that match the colors of the scopes, therefore matching the colors of the two shots and getting the dune desert look. This nighttime scene was actually shot in daytime. Well, not pure daytime, but dusk. Day for night is a technique that movies have used for years. Cameras typically don't have the sensitivity of the human eye in low light scenarios. That means that if this scene was actually shot at night, it would look something like this. This is why the filmmakers of Dune decided to film these scenes in dusk and use color grading techniques to create an illusion of darkness. There are two big reasons why they would shoot this at dusk and not at day. Firstly, there are the shadows, which would appear unnatural when the footage is color graded to simulate nighttime. While one could wait for overcast weather or attempt to pass off the shadows as being cast by strong moonlight. But the second issue with shooting day for night are the actors squinting. For these reasons, they decided to shoot at dusk and gradually expose and color grade the shots to transition to day. Let's recreate this look in Kafka. Basically, by looking at the scopes on the video that we're gonna color grade and the reference seen from the movie, we can see that we can start by desaturating our shot. Next step is to get the exposure levels to the ones of the reference. We'll lower the illumination and brightness all the way down. It's still way too bright, so we'll go to the curves and play with the master curve to darken the shot even more. For the final touch, we just need to add some more cold tones, so we'll push the temperature to blue and tint to green. Prime is a plastic world, an artificial world cut from nature, a totalitarian environment where the rulers are, are fascist. And, and, and I thought that this idea to subtract color from their world will say something about their way of thinking. And, and, and uh, I came with this idea that the sunlight will uh, be monochromatic, black and white. Uncle, how can we let this happen? How can the Emperor take everything we built and give it to that Duke? And also, we hadn't seen Getty Prime in the daytime, really. We'd seen other planets in the daytime. We'd seen, obviously, Arrakis in the daytime. But we hadn't really seen Getty Prime in the daytime. The danger, really, was that, that, that Getty Prime in the daytime was going to look like Arrakis. You like two scenes with sunlight. You're in a, in a stadium that, sure, is a bit greyer, but it's still got sand. And sure, the sand might be white, but not. there are similarities there. And he was like, well, why don't we do this in black and white? Greg Fraser, of course, loved the idea and he, he brought himself the idea of uh, infrared cameras. The only time that we ever experience infrared is when we're looking at our security cameras at night. You know, if when you're looking at your doorbell camera, when, the, when your porch light's not on and you've got somebody come to your door and you see that kind of really odd looking ghoulish kind of face. None of us look, you know, very good in that sort of light. I said to Denis, well, listen, if we're, if we're thinking about black and white, why don't we consider this technique? And I did a little test and showed him, and he was like, that's it. Let's just do that. The skin will become translucent, milky, and you will see the veins of the character, and the eyes will be suddenly very percy and like reptilian. That way of using IR was bringing a very alien feeling to the scene that I really loved, and quite a unique look for, for Giddy Prime. Show me who you are. <laughs> The, the, the studio that uh, that's the, one, the way I wanted to do it and that there will be it, it will be black and white like that there were we, we could not bring back the color I can't repeat the past can't repeat the past no why of course you can of course you can <laughs> Okay, enough joking, let's recreate this look in Kafka. We'll start by decreasing the saturation, making our shot black and white. Then we'll increase the contrast just a bit. Since the dune scene was shot with infrared cameras, the faces look a bit translucent and brighter. So we'll go to the HSL section, and since the skin tones were mostly orange and red, before we desaturated the shot, 
we'll select the red and orange range and bump up the brightness a bit. This way we're affecting just the face of our subject. Our shot is looking close to the one from the movie, but the movie shot still has those milky skin tones as Denny described it, especially when you compare it to our shot. Luckily for us, CapCut has this enhanced feature, where it recognizes the face from a subject and enables us to adjust various parameters. So we'll increase the smooth parameter to get those milky skin tones. And for the final touch, we'll brighten up the face just a bit more. If you want to check out CapCut, the link will be in the description. And if you want to color grade your videos and photos like Dune and other movies, check out our Movie LUTs and Lightroom profiles. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.